Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me and uh, I think we should congratulate the LSEC uh, community for this amazing building. Hopefully it will inspire other universities in Israel, including mine, to build a neuroscience dedicated building at the end. Um, so I will speak today about the connectome. We all have seen diffusion tensor images and we'll see what more we can do with it um, uh, in relation to the structure function on the brain and eventually evolution. I would start by thanking the collaborators of the work, especially my colleague uh, Yossi Yovel, uh, who have done this path of taking MRI into evolution uh, together. So we start with the holy grail in neurosciences to understand the relation between the function and the structure of the brain. Uh, for many reasons, one of them is very practical. It's more easier non-invasively to measure the structure of the brain than the function. Therefore, if we will be able to infer the relation between these two, we might be able to say much more than we can do now about cognition and behavior. However, structure can be in many scales in the brain. and It's important which scales are we looking at. We can look at the macro scale or the gross scale of the gray matter and white matter, or also the molecular or cellular level, as we have seen uh, throughout uh, the last two days. However, there are two mesoscales uh, in terms of, of structure in the brain. One of, the, uh, one of them is the connectome, and the other, was, and the other one is the ulnar layers. Taking, uh, and, and there is a, a connections between them. The, the, the layers of the cortex are forming the connectomes while they develop, and vice versa. And, and it was said by Marcel Meshulam that nothing defines better the function of the neuron than the connections it forms. And therefore, we'll, uh, 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 we'll go deeper into the issue of the connectome uh, in this, in this uh, lecture. So why the connectome is important? The mass array of connections, as we've seen in, in, the, in the last talks, uh, between all components of the nervous system. And, and to say the least, not only neurons, glial cells connection is as important as any other in the brain, and we should include them as well. At the end, the connectome, the connectome is a map, is a graph, as, as we've seen in Olaf's, Olaf's talks. And it's across, about, across different scales, from, from the neural level to the system level at the end. And in order to understand the network, we need to know the topology of it. We need to know who connects to who, then we can do some more computations on it uh, eventually. And, and it will help us also to understand the brain and structure to, to function relation. And we do know now that the connectome affects our cognition and behavior we will see in a minute. And some people say, I'm not one of them, but some people say that as gene encodes our body, connectome might encode ourselves, our mind, and maybe this is what makes us humans at the end. We'll, we'll try to answer it at the end. So exploring the connectome. So the connectome, as we've seen, was, was explored by mapping all neurons of, of the C elegans and, 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 and providing a very, very definite map of, of the connections within. There are, there are now very uh, more attempts to look at the entire species, but the problem just scales up. From 300 neurons, when we get to the mouse brain, we are speaking about 70 million neurons. And, and there are several attempts to deal with it. Either uh, Most of them are invasive, obviously, uh, uh, by, by, by uh, track tracing method in order to, to, to come up with a connectome, or by histology, uh, electron microscopy, to recreate a certain part, a certain part of, of this massive connection. And the problem becomes even more severe when we go to the human brain, when you have 100 billion neurons, uh, again, putting aside the glial cells, which is just as much as that. So obviously, there's, there's an issue. But this is a very hot topic in neuroscience today, and we raised up a debate, uh, for example, in this paper in October 2012, about the debate, do, do we need to measure the connectome? And there are pros and cons to that. One of them is uh, if we are poor measuring the connectome at a very highly detailed neuronal level, uh, it will give us the full characterization of all neuronal connections in, in the brain. It allows us to investigate the network at a new level of details, an extremely high level of details. And it provides a base for brain activity of simulation, and there are consortiums and, 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 uh, and large groups that are working on that. On the other side, the people are, the, are against that suggest that this is an enormous amount of data. Obviously, we are able to cope with that amount of data. The computers are getting stronger and stronger, and eventually we will be able to cope uh, with that amount of data. But do we, do we really need that amount of data in order to understand uh, brain connectivity? Uh, one thing that we'll not be able to overcome uh, doing that kind of, of method to measure the, con the connectome, that this is ex, ex vivo data, and it, it limits our understanding of the dynamics and eventually the behavior, and limits us to a specific small number of species, of, of samples that we are measuring. 
And last but not least, and, and as equally as important as everything, it does not include glial cells. And we do know, as we heard in the morning, that glial cells are, are very important in anything the brain does, as important as, as the neurons, and should get more attention, especially when thinking about connectomes and connectivity. So the question is that we need to ask ourselves, to see or not to see, do we really need to see every synapse to know that is there? Do we really need to see? every connection to characterize the connectome. And I would argue with you that not, we don't have to see all of them, and maybe we can have an open discussion with it uh, later on in the, in the panel. Luckily, we have MRI, and MRI is our link between the methods to get it into the non-invasive, to the non-invasive method and explore, explore the human brain uh, in vivo. There are, so I'm an MR, MR physicist at the end, not a uh, neurobiologist as well, neuroscientist, but, but in my beginning I'm an MR physicist, so this is my comfort zone. This is the, the slide that I'm very comfortable about. There are many methods with MRI, dozens of methods with MRI, that are used uh, uh, to, look, uh, to look at the brain. Uh, the most conventional are the anatomical, one, uh, anatomical ones giving us the gross, uh, the gross anatomy of the brain. Luckily, like the diffusion tensor imaging, uh, it, it is becoming more popular and, and more easily acquired in the brain and providing us a microstructural problem, giving us a, 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 the ability to look at the microstructure, although it's not a microscope. We won't be seeing the cells, we don't need to see them, but we can get information of them. So this is to see or not to see. We don't need to see the synapse, we don't need to see the cell, but we get the information of them and the information is as important as seeing them. What do I mean? we get the information. Because when we measure diffusion, we actually measure the translational, translational motion of water molecules. And that doesn't happen on the millimeter or meter scales. That happens on the micron scales. And the micron scales is the cellular level at the end. So if we zoom to certain regions and let this molecule, uh, this uh, water molecules to diffuse inside it, we'll see that we can get information, we can get, gain information about the structures by just probing the diffusion. There are many ways to do that, and diffusion tensor imaging is just one of the methods uh, for that. So just in a nutshell, really in a nutshell, just to say what these colorful images are all about. So we want to measure that. We want to measure the connections. We want to, to, to see that. We want to, to understand the connectivity and the end. And, and within a voxel, the problem is that, we need, that when we measure diffusion, we measure it in a directional way. So usually when you, when you read papers about diffusion, you will see it's, it's a, a high angular uh, resolution of, of acquisition of the motion of water molecules. With, at the end, we summarize it into a model. And the model that we use here is a tensor model, just putting everything, all the complexity of the tissue within this simple structure at the end. Putting that in all different models, event, all different voxels in the brain, allows us to glean some information about, um, about the microstructure, about the connectivity. There are several summation indices out of diffusion uh, tensor imaging. One of them, the most common of them, is the fractional anisotropy and the mean diffusivity. Give us information about the microstructure, which we'll uh, define in a minute. But more of them is the color-coded map. So giving them the most, uh, the amazing name, diffusion tensor, tensor orientation color map, very catchy. But what it, what it shows us is the orientation of this, of this ellipsoid, which, which fibers that cross from left to right will be in red colors, fibers are uh, going from inferior to superior will be in blue, and from anterior to posterior in green, give us, giving us the three-dimensional information within a 2D image, eventually just looking something like that. Aside for, for the FA giving us an you know, um, interpretation of fiber organization and mean diffusivity, tissue density, and the column maps of fiber orientation, we can use a, a streamline approach in order to connect these regions and, and get information about the fiber architecture in the brain. And this g brings us to the level that we can look at the connectivity or look at the connectome at different orders of man magnitude, either by this summation indices, the FA and, or the mean diffusivity, or by exploring it on the whole <laughs> macro scale connection system level, again at different scales, so we can zoom into different regions of the brain and see different uh, types of connections uh, within. So in the lab, we are doing a lot of stuff with it. Most of the work uh, in, in, with diffusion imaging is done on working on brain plasticity. The things that I will show you to the rest of the talk will be the hobby <laughs> of, of, um, of, uh, of our work. But, but in the work, we are looking at short-term experience-driven plasticity, where you can see changes in the features of the connectome in specific, in specific regions. So this is short-term. Um, um, spatial navigation and motor sequence learning causing uh, diffusion changes in specific cortical regions. 
as well as lifelong related environmental plasticity uh, that will then enrich environment in mice and extinction of habits uh, in, in, uh, again in mice as well, as well as looking at the cross-generation related plasticity, look, looking at, at connectivity changes that happens at, at, the, at second generation uh, to mice that didn't have a proper diet, leading to some changes, her heredity related genetic uh, changes uh, in the brain. So this is a, a epigenetic effect on connectivity. So genetics and the structure of the brain or environments and the structure of the brain are connected in a way. And although if we look at these embryos, all of them look the same, so obviously they have some share of, of, of common genetic ancestry, but exploring their connectomes seems that might be some, that might be difference between them. And looking at their, what they look like in real life, obviously they are different. Uh, this is just to say, this is Yossi Ovel, my colleague, uh, that works. This is, not, uh, this is not a picture of him as an embryo. <laughs> so just to get an information of how the connectome may, may change in relation to difference in function of different animals. So if we look at the mammalian class, and then look at a specific, specific uh, order within them, uh, and of specific animals, uh, subfamilies and then specific uh, species. We can look at the connectomes of all of them. And eventually, so we can see here the, the, the brain connect, the, the fiber tracts, not the connectome yet, the fiber tracts of a deer, of a dolphin, of a porcine. And the difference, the functional difference between these species, for example, is that the dolphin communicates uh, by the sonar rather than by his eyes as, as compared to the other, other animals. And if we will just try to track, just to, to, to find the track, of, of the uh, auditory radiation, we will see that it is much thicker, much thicker and bigger in the, in the dolphin brain, obviously compared to the human brain, which is much smaller than that. So there is variations in the connectome, and we want to see where the structure to function changes uh, map in the brain. Wait, how do you the DTI in the dolphin? In a minute, we'll get to there. In a minute, you will see uh, many animals, <laughs> the DTI of many, many animals. Uh, so we get, just in a minute, we'll get there. Uh, when you go through the literature of, of, brain of, of brain evolution, it seems that it's all about the gray matter. So we, we saw this, these pictures uh, in the previous slide, so measuring the number of neurons, measuring the relation between the body and the brain size, uh, measuring the difference in cortical uh, maps uh, done by Lea Kubitzer, uh, etc. Well, it's not all about gray matter when we look at the brain. The white matter and the connectivity is also as important as, and, and, and we do know, so this, I, I think the slide, uh, this graph uh, appeared uh, before, but what it shows uh, is the volume of the white matter and the volume of the gray matter. It seems linear, but this is on a logarithmic scale. And if you see what the, the coefficient is, it means that the bigger the brain is, the more white, white matter it is. So obviously this is an important feature. It's not that it's scaling up uh, linearly with the gray matter, it's, it's, it's expanding more uh, than it is. And, and that graph is, is, is replicated in other, in other databases, including our own that is called MAMI. So MAMI, just for you that are not uh, Hebrew speaking, MAMI is the Hebrew word for a sweetheart, the, the common word for a sweetheart, but also for mammalian MRI collection, uh, we call it like that. So what is the mammalian MRI connection? This is the collection, and the first word that should come into your mind is, this is crazy, and it's, indeed it it's, is crazy. I don't have time in this talk to get into details how we collected all the brains. Some of the, <laughs> some of the stories are quite funny, and I will be happy to share that information with you afterwards. Uh, but we do have 117 different species uh, uh, in our collections. Uh, here are colored by the different, uh, different uh, orders, uh, the, the ungulates, the carnivores, the primates, and, and uh, some of those, the smaller, smaller orders. And eventually, so we have, and, and with replicas within. So with replicas within a species all together, at the moment, we have 220 brains in the collections, uh, in the collections, and it's growing on a weekly basis. And again, this is a crazy, crazy, crazy data set. So it's include, so all the brains are excised, are excised. Needless to say, no animals were deliberately harmed in these in this projects. We get them because they die in the wildlife or in zoos, as, as you asked. So, so for the dolphin, it was just found in, in the seashores of, of, of the Mediterranean Sea. And we do, uh, we have a connection with the Israeli, Israeli Veterinary Institute that enables us to get the brains uh, for measurements. 
So this is just to give you an example of a few animals in the collection. And you can see the difference, the, the variability uh, between how, how the, the fiber tracks looks like in the brain. And just to compare, uh, the, the, the main issue in this project is that we have a huge variability in the sizes of the brain. So this is obviously an, a, a concern. Just to example, this is the smallest brain that we, that we have measured, the trident bat. There is no way to explain you how small the brain is. You can actually almost not see it with your naked eyes. It's that small. And it, has, it, had, it had to be scanned for days in the scanner to get the amount of information that will be comparative to the other species. This is the largest brain that we scanned, the strip dolphin, which was something like that, uh, that we had to scan on, on, a, on a human scanner, not on the animal scanner, etc. So the, 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 the amount of data that we get is rich. But just looking at it, we have some kind of... of Geometrical, geographical problem because the brain looks quite different and how we can compare between them and, and get the information out of it. So to do that, we had to recreate for each of the brains the surface, the surface of the brain, and then segment it into equally spaced patches. 100 on the left hemisphere and 100 on the right hemisphere. Then uh, to create, uh, each one of them was noted as a node, and then we used the fiber tract as, as, as arches taking into account the, the, graph, uh, the graph theory uh, that was presented in the previous uh, work. We have excluded in this analysis the projection fiber and the subcortex um, just to get information. And in the end, we get a connectivity matrix. And this connectivity matrix is something that we can compare across the different species because this is not at the geometrical, geographical uh, um, space of the animal. This is now the connectivity, uh, connectivity space. So we have the, 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 these two bunches are the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and in between them, the off-diagonal, are the commissural, uh, uh, commissural areas. There are many parameters that can be measured with, with, uh, with the graph theory. Uh, uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm not a mathematician, and this is not my expertise, so we took the very, very first low-level parameter that we can extract with it, which is the mean shortest path. What is the shortest path that we can get from one point to any other point in the brain, and then average all of them? And it is sort of, sort of, of, of a very naive and simple measurement of the efficiency of the network at the end. So taking that and looking across all animals, this is it, doesn't change much. And it was surprising uh, to begin with, but any animal that we added to this, to this uh, database just fell randomly in this graph, which means one thing, it may be a good or not a good parameter to look at, but, but eventually it seems to be something that is preserved. When, when you look at it, it, it doesn't relate to the, to the brain volume. Uh, it doesn't relate to the, to the, to the exact uh, uh, order of the animal within the mammalian class. It doesn't relate to anything. So it seems to be something preserved. So that can be bad in terms that we don't find any nice finding. It could be also good because if we learn something from biology and especially bioinformatic, that things that are important are things that are preserved through, through evolution at the end. So, but what can we do with it? What, what can we say about it at the end? And the thing is that, that we do get information between the, the connectivity is not, it's, the, the matrix is not similar uh, within the hemisphere and between the hemisphere. There are some difference between them. Putting it on the circular graph where the, where the left hemisphere is on the top half and the right hemisphere is on the, the bottom half, you can see the crosses, and the crosses are the commissural fiber system. And maybe there is something there. And why do I, and, and, and we try to explore it, and we did, again, we didn't find anything, just because there is a huge variability in the amount or the, or the, the amount of percentage of commissural fibers that we have in the brain. Again, doesn't relate to anything uh, related to brain volume, doesn't relate to a specific uh, um, order, doesn't relate within a species. There's, there's a, even a huge variability within a species, and we do know it from the human brain uh, that there is a huge variability in the, in the, at least in the corpus callosum size. And all right, so there is a huge variability, and we wanted to explore from where this variability comes from. And, and so we know what are the commercial fibers in the brain. There are five. Uh, three of them are larger than, than the other two, and these are the corpus, uh, hippocampal commissure, and the anterior commissure which we wanted to explore. And if we will just try, try to look if there is a relation, no, not between the, the mean, total mean uh, network mean short path and brain volume, but between the hemispheric mean short path, things that happen within the hemisphere, within the hemisphere, and the amount of commissural fibers that we have. Because you can think of the two hemispheres as two different, of two networks that 
are one side of the other, and the only way to communicate between them or reduce or, or, or increase the efficiency of the network is the commercial fiber. And then it comes up. We have a nice correlation. It's not a very strong one, obviously because of all the, 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 the large database, it is significant, but it's a correlation. So the amount of, the, 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 the more commercial ratio, the more commercial fibers we have, we have the less efficient, efficient in a way, uh, the hemisphere is. So there seems to be some interplay between them. But, but again, there is a huge variability in the database. So looking at the commercial, where, are, where does the commercial variability comes from? So this is the human brain, uh, Yossi's brain. And this is a kangaroo brain. And the kangaroo we know from evolution, they don't have a corpus callosum. They don't have it. Most of the commercial fibers go through the anterior commissure. And this is where the variability comes out uh, to this project. But it's not only the marsupials that don't have it, it's for, for the, within the, within, even within a certain, a certain class. So this is a, a certain order. So this is a cave nectar bat that has, you can see the anterior commissure in green, the hippocampal commissure in blue, and the corpus callosum. A very small corpus callosum, but again, a small a corpus callosum that we can think of uh, in red. But looking at an officiating bat, these, these animals didn't diverge in the evolution tree that far from one another. But the fish in the eating bed doesn't have a corpus callosum. And this induces a huge variability in the amount of communication between the hemisphere across all the different animals. And again, if we calculate the anterior to corpus callosum volume fraction, we see huge variability across the different, uh, the different uh, orders. For example, the marsupials, obviously, they have the anterior commissure. They don't have a corpus callosum, so it's a very big number. Also, the bats have much more anterior commissure than corpus callosum. But for the other, other animals, including the pi primates, carnivores, uh, the corpus callosum has become the major communication path. And if we take the, the, the graph that I showed you before and just show it for the different, for the different uh, orders. So for, for we see the nice correlation between the commercial ratio and the hemispheric uh, mean short path for, for the even toed ungulates and for the, for the primates and for the carnivores, and for the rodents, it's all nice, but you don't see it, it disappears, when we get uh, to the marsupials and, uh, and the bats. They don't have a corpus callosum, they do have colossal fiber, but they seem to, to, to abandon or to not have this compensation in the brain, which is strange. It's interesting, it's I don't have an answer for that, but this is uh, an observation that, that needs more attention at the end. But when we remove the, 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 the animals that don't have a corpus callosum for the graph, these correlations become much more significant and much more stronger than that. So it seems that there is a compensation, there is a converse, cons, conservation of network efficiency in the brain that seems to be modeled or compensated by the corpus callosum at the end. And it's not that you can find it uh, between species only, you can find it within a species as well. We know, we know from anatomical MRI scan that there is a huge variability in the size and the shape of the corpus callosum across, across humans. And this is a selection of 20 humans, and you can see that some of them has a very thin corpus callosum, some of them has very thick corpus, corpus callosum, some of them has a, a, a bigger area in the splenium, some of them have bigger area in the genome, so there is a huge variability at the end. And we find the same correlation. This is within a species, within the species. And what amazing me the most is the variability, the variability in commercial, only within uh, the human, uh, within the human species, you can find subjects that have a uh, very high commercial ratio and, 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 and subjects that have very low commercial ratio. Actually, this is me. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the last on the list here. Uh, so I have a very poor commercial ratio, but obviously compensated somehow uh, for that at the end. And if we look at the, uh, the connectomes or the graph that, 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 that created, we can see this variability. For example, for this specific subject, you can see the amount of, 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 of wet connections. This is the commercial fiber, very uh, large amount of connection, but leaving the hemispheres poorly connected or less connected, and vice versa. In my brain, for example, very poor connections between the hemisphere, but much richer connectivity within the hemisphere at the end. And it's not surprising, we all know of the movie The Rain Man, and we do know that there are syndromes in, in genetics mutation that cause agenesis of the corpus callosum. And these people that, that have very poor connectivity between their hemispheres are alive and they are functioning. And, 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 and I would love to scan one of those, if you know one, and to see how, how thick his hemispheric connectivity is at the end. 
So to summarize, I think that the main take home message of this, of this presentation is that brain network efficiency seems to be preserved across the mammalian class. And this database, which is very rich, is like the basis of exploring what are the characteristics of this, of this connectivity, of this connectome that causes the different behavior and the different functions uh, between the different animals. And this is just looking at the evolution from the kangaroo to the human brain of the Ontario and the Corpus Callosum. And thank you. Thank you very much. We we'll start with a question. Tell me, you look at it's a cool, cool talk. Thank you very much. Do you look at variability in humans, which is only a factor two? Why not look at the most glorious species ever, Carlos Domestico? Do you get a Chihuahua? Do you get a Great Dane or, or uh, uh, you know, Bernese Mountain Dog, where you have this variability, almost a factor of 50 in, in mass? So you. Yeah. I mean, yes, we've looked at it. <laughs> in Chihuahua so and in uh, Bernese? You find it in, in cats, in dogs, you find the same relation. In macaques, we, have, we were able to get... Uh, Even within, within, within that large within variability. Within that large variability, you can see the same, uh, the same relation. And, and well, obviously, when you, when you first think of it, you think, well, maybe it's an artifact of that analysis. But the fact that you can't find it in, in bats, you can't find it in the marsupial, says that there is something... Uh, and it's not related to brain size. There's something meaningful in this connectivity analysis, yeah. But you do find it in, 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 the, in the dogs as well. So if I understood you correctly, then you have uh, focused here on, on intracortical connections. Cortical cortical and, connections. And uh, ne neglected uh, the subcortical. The relationship between cortical and subcortical is, is very different in the different species. So how could that influence the results that you have presented? Well, I can't, I can't really tell, but, but saying that we need to explore it. <laughs> Definitely, we need to explore it. Uh, we did it just because of complexity. Uh, the, the main problem in the analysis, uh, anyone that, that worked on segmentation uh, can acknowledge that, uh, that uh, taking out the subcortex from the cortex, especially in species that they don't have much white matter and these structures are just one on top of the other, and then segmenting the subcortex to the different areas, and some of the bats, the bats, it's all together. You can't even see what, where the thalamus starts and then when the hypothalamus, etc. Uh, so it's complex. Obviously, we need to do that. We need to do that and understand. And I think that within at least bats or marsupials, the compensation will come from the subcortex because it's more ancient systems. Probably the compensation went there and then went up to the neocortex, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, they do, and they, yeah, so we did, yeah, yeah, so we did look at the fruit, but the fruit bats behave like all other uh, mammals, yeah, definitely. Okay, maybe uh, I can ask you to comment on one other thing. Uh, so you parcelated each of the species into, or the cortex, into 100 areas. Yeah, it was very painful. Like but that. couldn't that mean that for some species which have a few number of areas, you basically oversample each area, whereas for other species like humans that have presumably more than 100 areas, you actually undersample. Definitely. So actually we discussed that uh, with Olaf uh, just before this session. And, and one of the ideas is to have a differently sampled uh, connectomes and then compare that from, from very uh, small number of areas to much larger number of areas and then to compare that, definitely. There's a lot of work to be done. This is a work in progress which I just wanted to share with you here. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely it's an issue. Any additional questions? If that's not the case, thank you a lot.